All right, here we go. We have Tanisa Welch, a.k.a. the First Lady of BMF. Welcome to Vlad TV. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. How are you? Absolutely. Well, you have a very uh, incredible story, to say the least. Uh, but this is our first time talking, so I want to start in the very beginning. Okay. So you were born in Detroit. Yes. Born and raised uh, on the west side of Detroit. Mm -hmm. The west side. Okay, and at the time, the West Side was more kind of like middle class? Yes. I was born into a middle class family, lived with my three brothers, my mom and my stepdad. Okay, and where was your real dad at the time? My real dad was on the East Side. Oh, so he was around. <laughs> yeah, he was around. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did you have a, did you have a relationship with your real dad? Um, not until I, got, I knew my dad, um, but I didn't have a real relationship with him. Until I got a little older, until I got, you know, an, I was an adult. And we bonded from then, from there. Okay. So you're growing up in Detroit. And at the time, that's when the car companies were pretty much running yeah, the city. Both of my parents worked at the car company. I was raised with three brothers. My two oldest brothers worked there. I thought I was going to work there, but they're like, nah. Yeah, <laughs> you ain't working here. But that was just, you know, the life that I was born in. Most of my family were working at the auto industry, in the auto industry. Yeah. Okay. So you're growing up in the stable household. Everyone's working. Everyone's got good, stable jobs. Um, but then when you started to go out and see some of the more flashy parts of the city, that, that made you want it at a very early age, right? Right. Uh, like 19. I went to a party on the east side, and that changed my whole life. Yeah, the east side. Okay, but at 19, you also got pregnant. I was pregnant, and I think probably my son probably was no more than about six months old. And I went to a party, like I said, downtown on the east side of Detroit. And just that ex whole experience turned my life around. It's like I went in one door and came out and was a different person. Yeah, just okay, the whole excitement, was, huh? <laughs> and that was the, the Rooster Tail Club? That was the Rooster Tail, yes. And it was one of the hottest spots, you know, um, and at that time, especially for people on the east side. Okay, so here you are, 19 years old, still a teenager. Uh, you have a child. Yes. Um, you and the child's father ended up breaking up, right? Well, we stayed together for, no, uh, yeah, the ch I'm sorry, you're right. My child's father, he was my high school sweetheart. Yeah, we broke up. Okay, so now you're on your own, single mom. You start to, you know, party in Detroit, and then you meet this drug dealer named Harold. Yes. Okay, now at the time, so if we're talking about, you know, this was 1980. So when you look at, like, for example, the 70s in Detroit, did you see the drugs and the heroin and everything around, or were you kind of sheltered from it all? I was sheltered from that. Um, so, no, I didn't see it. I didn't grow up, you know, seeing it in my neighborhood. It wasn't in my household. So it was all something new for me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you go and meet Harold, and this is not like anyone that's really been around you before. Nope. Totally different. It was like everybody was different. Um, they were in there dressed to the nines. They were partying. Um, then they had champagne. It was just like everything was beautiful to me. You know, even if you go to the Rooster Tail, they still have the same decor. Um, it looks the same. I mean, everything was, I mean, it's a little updated, but the walls, the staircase, they refurbished everything that looked the same. And so going, um, I went back there, I think, what, last year? And it just brought all back the memories of where I was standing, where I seen him at, you know, the whole ballroom experience. It just brought, you know, back all those memories. Okay, so you meet, you meet Harold, and... He was a drug dealer, but not like a major, major drug no, dealer. No, he wasn't a major. At the time. Uh-uh. Yeah. Okay. And at the time, it was heroin, right? It was heroin. But he was hanging with, uh, you know, higher level drug dealers. So he was just like, you know, a little underlord. But he was, yeah. Uh, okay. And, I mean, when you talk about heroin, that's really one of the most dangerous drugs out there. I mean, the junkies who, who need a fix... Mm -hmm. We'll we'll do we'll do anything. They'll kill anybody. They'll they'll steal from anybody. Their own parents, whatever, just to not get sick. 
I mean, I've, I've just heard absolute horror stories when it comes to heroin. So, so suddenly you're thrown to this world with a heroin dealer. And, and how crazy does it get in the beginning? In the be beginning, it was exciting to me. I had no fear. You know, it, when I think back at, on those days, I think like, what was I really thinking? Why didn't I have fear? You know, I didn't grow up in that lifestyle, but just seeing it, um, I wanted to really just know about it. I wanted to like, you know, how do you do this? And how much, you, you know, you make off this? And he was just showing me the ropes and I just wanted to be involved. It didn't scare me. I didn't, no fear at all. It's just like, I just, and even now I think about it, you know, you know, selling it and getting it ready for the people in the mornings. I'm like, how did I do that? You know, how did I do that? to this community. I just think being so young and, you know, fearless and, you know, just the ignorance, didn't know, you know, didn't even feel like, oh, you hurting these people. I just wanted to be involved in it. And the greed and the excitement, I wanted to be like those people, you know, those were the people that I was, I started to look up to, you know, the people that were okay. selling, yeah, the drug dealers, yeah. Okay, but then it moved from heroin to cocaine. Mm -hmm. And cocaine was more like, at the time, more like the fly drug, like the, the rich man's high, right? right? Mm -hmm. a and you guys started moving that in the west side, which is the more... No, we you know, started that on the east side. He started that oh, too on the east side. You know, okay. he was doing both. And then what happened, how we got to the um, west side, I was telling him, I think we can make more money on the west side because... For in my head, I thought it was more people that were using the drugs and had more money. So if we took it over there, that we can make more money, you know. So that's how that happened. But it started on the east side. It started with just, you know, a small quantity. It was like, okay, I'm, let's do this, you know. And I'm like, always so down. <laughs> like, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let, uh, you know. And I'm always thinking, like, I can do it better, you know. Or I can, you know. I can help you. I can be like your partner. You know, let me help. Let me just, you know, I just always wanted, for some reason, that life kind of excited me. You know, that money, the fast money, the fast lifestyle. I wanted that microwave life. And I seen it when I went to the rooster tail. Like, how, I want that coat. I want that ring. I want that watch. And I want a rat in that car, you know. So it was exciting. And I knew by talking to him and seeing that the crowd he was with, that the way to get it is the more, you know, you got to get the quantity and sell it. And the faster you sell it, the more money you were making the turnover. So I said, hey, let's go to the east side. I mean, let's go to the west side. I was familiar with the west side because that's where I was from. Okay. So you guys started making better money. I mean, you started out making about 1000 a week. And then you guys got to about 15000 a week. Yeah, it was good. Um, so the money started coming, but with the success... The relationship at home started to go downhill, and Harold started to actually beat you a lot. Mm -hmm. it's a, it became uh, a very abusive relationship, and that yeah. was something I had never seen or experienced either. So it was all new to me. Um, I don't, you know, people ask me well, why'd you stay. Why I, I, I still today can't answer that. You know, and I, even I ask other survivors, you know, we all have the same story like, oh, you know, thinking it'll change, thinking that you love this person, thinking you hate this, hurt, you know, help this person, or you thinking it's your fault. There's so many things that I can think, but I just stayed and I was stayed in that life. Well, the beatings continued until at one point you actually kicked him out of the house. Mm hmm. And uh, you thought that was the end of it, but it wasn't. Yeah. So what happened next? Um, I guess you're talking about the time that I said, okay, this is going to be my last ass whooping. Uh, yeah. I just, I knew it. You know, he would be gone for a couple of days. But then I said, when he come back, you know, he's going to be, you know, he's going to be angry or something's going to be, something's going to be wrong. So I prepared myself. You know, I said, okay, today it's not going to whoop on me. I'm going to make sure I'm going to kill him. I, I really felt like I wanted, I'm going to kill him today. I put my kids to sleep and I, you know, I got the knife. 
had already planned it, was laying there waiting on him to come. And as soon as he came in, he started. And that's when I just jumped up and stabbed him. What exactly did you stab him? I tried to really, I tried to stab him in, in the chest. I knew where I was going to stab him. But what I learned later afterwards, after he went to the hospital, I went to jail. I stabbed him somewhere up in the upper arm. I missed that part, which was good for me because probably at that time, I don't, I don't think the law was in place where you know they had the where the you know the man beat you, the spouse or abuse um, law, that wasn't in place. So I probably would have still been in prison for the rest of my life. So I guess it was a good thing. I mean, I did protect myself at that point, but you know, he survived. Right, he survived. You get locked up. Um. But he ends up not pressing charges. Right. Now, at um, that time, it was up to the person. Now, yeah. the states take over. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't press charges. You get out of jail. He gets out of the hospital. <laughs> and, then you, and then you guys get back together again. Toxic, right? Yeah. Now we know all about what toxic is. You know, then you didn't know. Just feeling like, okay. But I thought it was scaring him enough that he wouldn't do it again. But he didn't do it again for a while. You know, he was, you know, tiptoeing around me for a while. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you stabbed him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. tiptoe also. <laughs> yeah. I would be sleeping with one eye open, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then he ran and I chased him. I'm like, oh, you didn't die, right? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so you guys end up staying together. And then the drug business starts to expand. Yeah. And then by 1984, you guys end up getting a connect in Texas with the actual Mexican, well, one of the Mexican cartels. Mm -hmm. um, was crack around during this time? Yeah, crack was around. But, you know, as the, as your, we grew, crack was whack, you know. <laughs> it was like we didn't want, you didn't, you found, as you, as you grew in the, in the lifestyle, you always wanted to elevate. So it was no more, you know, going into the crack houses or, you know, delivering in the crack houses or he's staying in them or we staying in them. It was once you got the connect, you start getting your level, our level went up and we start getting the kilos. So, yeah. Right. But, you know, at the lower level, but we, we had, but being sold. let me back you up. We first had the connect yeah. in Chicago. We got mm -hmm. the connect in Chicago first and then Texas. Okay. Got it. But what I was going to say is though, even though you guys were moving weight, you know, with cocaine crack was hitting Detroit. Right. And the effect of it was, was massive. It, right. it wasn't like cocaine or even heroin for that matter. Right. Because suddenly you know, everyone's fiending for it. There's a lot more money. You could you could chop stuff up yeah. and, you know, mix it with a baking soda. And then, you know, the violence, you know, and the terror started to really increase. I mean, you were somewhat separated for it, but from it. But did you actually see all this happening? You were separated from it. You know, when you get to a level, you then you have lower end drug dealers buying it from you. So it was kind of separated from it. But when I look back at it, and look, you know, going to prison and seeing and hearing the stories and realizing it. Yeah, I mean, I guess you try, try to kind of turn a blind eye on it. That's not your concern. Your concern is I'm trying to sell these, these kilos or these drugs to get more money. That was the psychic in our heads at that time. That was the foolishness. That was, you know, the craziness. Just, hey, let's just yeah. get it, sell it you know, make more money, we can buy more things, we can do this, you know. That, at that time, we didn't even understand that, you know, we thought that was the life, you know, that was our life, that was just our lifestyle. We didn't, to me, we must not know any better that we could have did something else, you know. Right, because, I mean, with this, with this Mexican Connect, you guys were getting like 50 kilos every two weeks. Yeah, we, it was which is. It's you a know, lot of like money. That's a million dollars, essentially. Yeah. We were making a lot of money. Well, you know what? When yeah. I think about it, he was making a lot of money. I was just <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like well, where's my money? <laughs> like, oh, I always think about that's a joke to me. Like, I'm like, it's half mine, you know, but I was letting him pay me. Like, no, I was just doing just as much work too as sometimes. 
you know, at some points. <laughs> okay. And and the money started coming in. You guys started buying mansions, started well, buying Mercedes, boats. Well, well, <laughs> you know? what, what, Harold, let me back up. We wasn't buying mansions. We did buy a home, but then we did buy the cars. You know, the typical, I just, I don't like to say it, but just the typical crazy ignorant shit. Like, we gonna buy, we gonna have this house, we gonna have these big ass cars in the driveway. You know, like, it's just like, oh my God, what were you thinking? Yeah. But we did have the cars, you know, we always had the updated cars, we always had the updated furs, the jewelry, you know, the whatever was in, in style at that time. We were wearing, at that time, like $9,000 boots and, you know, $5,000 shoes and, you know, getting our outfits and leather outfits made, custom made, you know, hair, hair was a real nice dresser. So everything had to be, you know, either custom or expensive. He had very expensive taste when it came to, you know, how he dressed and what he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you guys are building up this business. Mm -hmm. uh, you and Harold have a baby. Yes. And the business is continuing, you know, continuing to expand and so forth. And then I guess it was Harold's idea to bring in a couple, couple guys to help out. And that was Big Meech and Southwest T. Okay. Did you know about these guys beforehand? No. He just had to, you know, um, call me. I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm not mistaken. Maybe he told me the night before, and let me know that we were gonna be. I was gonna be meeting them, and um, we always meet on my Coyle Street. That was the street I grew up on. So it's the famous Coyle Street. We did everything on that street. Um, so we they came over there, and met us. I met them then. Uh Okay, and Big Meech and Southwest T would later on form BMF, but at the time, were they the 50 boys? I don't know what they were at the time. <laughs> I, I really don't. I, you know, the, the 50 boys is, I mean, I don't know if I forgot about it, if Terry ever told me about it. That was something that I didn't know about. I knew that they were, um, I didn't even know what level they were on. I knew that they just sold, you know, they were selling crack. I did re know that. But I don't know, you know, like how much money they were making or anything like that. I just know that we needed help. He needed more help. Um, so he was, you know, hit, at that time, I guess you would call it, let's recruit some more people. And um, by me having my younger son, a lot of times I couldn't move the way I wanted to move anymore. Right. And, you know, the two of them had already been in, in a lot of drama. Uh, T had his eye shot out by that time, you know, over over incident with a girl, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Meech, Meech had gotten shot as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that was before or after, but right I, around the same time. I guess a little, a, a little bit before. And I knew I heard yeah. it was about a girl. You know, Once I again, think it was yeah, um, girl. Meech's girlfriend or something like that. Yeah. Meech's baby mom. Yeah. Exactly. So, so these guys kind of had a lot of heat on them, but but they were, you know, still in the game and still still trying to expand. And you know, you're actually nine years older than Southwest T. Yes. But I guess the two of you sort of hit it off in the beginning. Yes. But okay. not as a in a relationship. No, not we. He was just became a person that I was going through so much, and you know. Um, and Hero had kind of put him to be around me, um, to kind of, you know, stick around me to watch what was going on. Because I was in, you know, still doing a few things. And by that, we became friends. So I confided in him a lot, you know, of what was going on. I'm thinking in my head that people didn't know or didn't see it or didn't understand it. So he was somebody that I confided in, that I trusted. Um, yeah, and that's how that happened. But we didn't um, start a relationship until years later. Yeah, but I mean, he did say, you know, in the, the Trap Queens episode that it was love at first sight. Yeah, he told sight. me like, as soon as I jumped out the car, like, boop, 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 and jumped out, you know. <laughs> and um, he seen me and he told me that later that it was love at first sight. He said that at, 
he was going to get me. And I guess it was like, you know, like the prosecutor um, put it in when I was going to uh, my trial. She was making it like the Scarface story. You remember how Ellsmerelda and then Scarface was looking at her and then it was the older boss. She looked at that story like that. And I, I guess yeah. I can kind of see the similarities. Yeah. Now, was Sosa around during this time at all or no? When I met Sosa, I think Sosa was like in college. You know, I don't think he had a car. I think he lived, he was living with his parents or his mother or something like that and his sister. I don't remember Sosa like that. Um, I've come to find out later on he, you know, he was always, they would go up to the college and hang out. He was just a college boy. And sometime later in the years, like later in the years, he became the driver, like in the 2000s. But all through the 90s, I don't remember him at all. I don't remember him even being in a lifestyle. I don't remember him as being a player to even have, even be at a level that I was at, you know? Yeah. Mm. Well, okay. So, you know, the, the BMF guys are now kind of rolling with you. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but you guys have the, the connect. Mm -hmm. You guys have the plug with the cartel, but then your cartel plug gets knocked. Harold and the cartel gets knocked, yeah. Okay. So then you guys go and meet up with the replacement for the guy that the cartel sent for you to now buy drugs from. And yeah, that that's when I got knocked. Yeah, that's when Harold got knocked in. Um, yeah. Say eighty and ninety, and he went to prison. In, yeah, and he went to prison in ninety one. Right. So I guess the the new guy that the cartel sent for you guys to link up with was actually working with the feds at yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and he set up you guys to get busted. So then when when Harold went and made the phone call to talk about the drug deal. Next thing you know, yeah. your house gets raided, the stash houses get raided, and it all goes to hell. Yeah, and I'm and I was telling them like, don't fuck them, don't don't do it, don't do it, because I felt it, you know. Even like when we had met them in Texas, and I told them, you know, what I felt. Even leaving Texas, we didn't leave together. We left out a different, he drove to, I think we were in Dallas or something like that. We drove to different airports. I got stopped in the airport, I'm, you know, so I knew it was going down. And by the time we got home, he made it home. He thought, I guess he thought, well, we made it home. But I still felt it, like, you know, that was something wasn't right. If you get that shipment, we're going to be fucked up. And... um. I'm sorry if I, <laughs> sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, we're right. going to be fucked. And, and I'm sitting there telling him, like, don't call, don't call. And he was like, but they keep calling. I'm like, don't call them. I'm telling you, don't call. Don't call back. And I guess that was the call to make sure because at some point we must have lost them. And he, when, they, when he got home, he was still running around the call to make sure where he was at. So when he called, like that morning, it all went down. And I was like, told you don't call. Okay. He was arrested and charged. Mm -hmm. uh, you were not arrested. No. Um, and he ends up getting seven years in prison. Right. You know, in the process of him starting his sentence, I guess uh, your lawyer said that you guys should get married. <laughs> Uh, you know, I guess in terms of like legally and, and, and so forth, it, it made more sense at the time. So I guess, was that to prevent you from taking the stand against him and, and stuff like that or? Well, he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to take it to trial. He was going to do a plea, but what it thought made him look more stable, you know, that he was this family man, he had this wife and he had his kids. And this is what, they thought that would, you know, because I said my little bit in the court, wrote my little letter. He said what he had to say. And um, I wasn't really fearful of any of that because he always said that if it, anything went down, he was going to take it. You know, I need to be at home with the kids. He was going to take it. Which he did. He did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he could have dragged you into the whole thing. Yeah, he could have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he starts his bid. 
and you're now broke. You only have like 20,000 to your name. After yeah, because he took all our money <laughs> <laughs> that they didn't get and put it up for himself. And that's what I'd be thinking like, why well, I only had $20,000. I was out there working my ass off too. But yeah, that's what it was. And um, and I start, I was on my own. I, well, I knew what to do anyway. I was always doing it. And so, uh, yeah. And then I end up meeting my own people. And um, and it took off from there, you know? Okay. So you go and get your own plug. You go back to drug dealing. And then you and Southwest T started to get kind of close at that point? Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, he was coming back and forth from my life and like, you know, really just like, I really trusted him. He had my back, you know, um, I was Tell them basically, you know, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing it. You know, um, just always there, you know, always being supportive. You know, like my friend, he's my homie. It was just like my, you know, like one of my best friends, basically. It wasn't nothing involved at first. I we and T didn't, me and Terry didn't have our first kiss, I think, until like 95, something like that. So, yeah, we hung out, like literally hung out daily. Even went out of town together, did lots of things, um, but just being there. Okay, so you go back into drug dealing and you start making money. You got your own plugs, and you actually gave uh, T a loan for him to to start his own thing, and gave him some plugs and so forth. And they started to actually do well. They paid you back the money, and he actually started to blow up based on your connections and your money, <laughs> right? But, well, I didn't loan the money. What I did is I had a connection and my connect would always front front me or I, whatever I was doing. I had two. And um, I was like that person that they would just give it to me. Mm -hmm. and um, And I would just do things for them, you know? Like, actually, I would... I mean, do uh, some crazy, th I mean, just, yeah. And that's how I went. Basically, I didn't give him the money. I said, look, I'm going to help you. He was one day, it was just like, I couldn't, you know, just having such a hard time. And here I am, like, I'm balling out of control. You know, I'm like, you my friend, you know, I want, I can't see my friend like this. And um, he was like, no, no, it's going to be okay. I'm like, no, dog, I got you, you know, what do you need? So I, I talked to my people. Hey, this is what we going to do. But see, that was on my name. That was on my name. So when you say you got to pay that back, you have to pay that back. Because it was a it was a big amount each time, you know, until he got stable enough. So you have to, you know, that's why I was saying about my name. I like to keep my name good. And that's how it happened. And from there, it was just like... You know, turning back, and it just blew up, you know, like uh, like it was like overnight. Even though it wasn't overnight, it felt like overnight. Like you look, I spent you, your head turn around, and you're like, ooh, just major. He was moving lots of drugs. Right, and this is around 1994, right? 90, 94, 95, yeah. Okay, and was BMF a name at that point or no? No. Okay. It was just Terry, Terry and Meach. Terry and, and Tony. Uh, Terry and Tony. <laughs> Terry and Tony. <laughs> Let me clear the record. Terry and Tony. Yeah. I mean, okay. I mean, he took it wherever he took it. Like I said, I don't care where he took it, but everybody kind of ate off of it. Like I always say, people always say, oh, you know, I want to clear the narrative. I don't want people thinking that he came in and I just came along for the ride. I already had, I was already stable. I already had my home. You know, I knew what I wanted out of life. I had already said, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to make happen for me. And even when he was my friend, we were always talk about what we was going to do with our millions. When we get this million, when we get this million, what we're going to do. This is how far ahead we were thinking, me and him at that time. And so when I gave it to him, I guess he took it back to 
his brother and everybody else. But when they said, well, you didn't give it to me, I don't care who I gave it to. If I walked in the house and I brought a bucket of chicken and all y'all ate it, you got it from me. Right. Okay. And was that around the time they got the El Chapo Connect? Did they got it? Yeah. N no, I think that came later on. That, that came later on. Okay, got it. All right. I'm just trying to set up the, the timeline. I, I get okay. it. Uh, okay, so so then by 98, um, you and Southwest T are now a couple. You guys are romantic and, and so forth. Uh, you ended up divorcing Harold while he was still in prison, right? Well, I was trying to divorce him while he was still in prison. I was trying happen. to divorce him. Okay. Yeah. And um, Southwest T ended up moving to L.A. Um, Harold gets out of prison and... Then that's when the craziness happened. Right. Uh, describe the whole car situation. Um, I had flew back to Detroit. I was going back and forth to L.A. I flew back to Detroit, and a friend asked me to go out. I told I only told a couple of people that, you know, when I came back and forth, I felt it. You know, I was, like, trying to avoid them. No, I still had the kid by them. Um, and she asked me to go out with her. And I said, okay, I'll go out, but don't tell nobody I'm here. Don't tell nobody I'm in Detroit. But to find out, that was all a setup. He had got romantically involved with her. You know, she was telling him everything that I was doing because I was confiding in her. And she knew. So when she asked me to go out with her, I decided, okay, I'm going to I'm come back to Detroit. I'm going to hang out with you. I got in front of the, the bar, and something told me, don't go in. My spirit, I don't know what it was, God, definitely God, don't go in. So I didn't go in. I turned around and I started heading home. Evidently, he was behind me or he knew that I wasn't coming in. I guess she told him, oh, she's not coming. Yeah, I called her. I'm not coming in. She might have called him, said she's not coming in. And he beat me back to my house. I was heading back to my house. So as I was turning on my street, he, I, I had, I guess he knew my car. Well, he knew my car. He knew the headlights. And all I remember was something coming. It was no way to even, I, I guess I sh went and shocked to see this car, this truck plowing dead into me. And... What I remember next is him being in the car. I can't. Even, I couldn't even remember. Like, well, how did he, you know? Later on, when you think about, well, how did he get in the car? Because the door should have been locked. I don't know if it hit so hard the door janked up. I'm not for sure, but I remember him hit me, and then I was out. Um, afterwards, end up in the hospital, banged up really bad, like really bad. Um, at that time, he. He said that he was going to take my life, but something told him not to do it. God, again. Um, right, because he had a gun, right? He pulled a gun on you? Yeah, after, like, I didn't realize it at the time, but I knew something was hitting me. You know, I knew something. I knew it just wasn't his fist, you know, because I'm trying to protect myself, but I, my arm was broke. So it wasn't much I could do. I didn't realize my arm was broke, but I couldn't, you know, I couldn't even really focus enough to see what was going on. I was hit that hard. And later on, that's when he, you know, we talked about it years later and he told me it was the gun. He told me the whole story of how I got set up, he told me this whole story, you know, what he was, what he was going to do. And something said, don't. But he said, or some, he said, somebody yelled and said, don't do it. But he said it was nobody around. The street was just dark and empty. So he don't know where that voice came from. I always say it was this guy saying, no, don't do it. It's not our time. Don't do it. Okay. Is Harold still alive? Yeah, he's still alive. And we talked about it probably about a couple of years ago. Um, we talked about it a couple of years ago, and then we talked about it since I did Trap Queens. And he wanted me to tell the story. He said that he was tired. He felt that he knew how wrong he was. And he understood um, what was going on in his life. He grew up into that. And he was angry. And he knew, he's told me that I didn't deserve that. 
and that I need to tell my story to help other young women. No woman should go through what he put me through. He was very apologetic. I had never heard an apology like that, you know, and he was just like, you know, that um, I was something he didn't understand it because I was somebody he really loved. And he couldn't understand why he did that or why he was so angry all the time at me. Um, and then he said it wasn't, he told me it wasn't me, it was him. And that uh, before he left this earth, he just wanted to tell me that. And he wanted me to share the story and make sure that I shared with young women that what could happen. Okay, so you end up surviving that. Um, by 2000, you end up divorcing Harold, finally. Finally. And then you left Detroit and you moved to L.A., where, where Southwest T was already set up. And at that point, was BMF a thing? I think BMF came a thing probably like 2001 or two. That was okay, 2000. So close, close to that time. Yeah, it was in that so. pocket of air. Yeah. Okay. And, and you became sort of entrenched into the whole BMF thing since you and Terry were, were extremely close. Um, so at one point, right around 2001, it seemed like Southwest T and Big Meech had a falling out. They didn't have that. I don't know why that timetable was like that. They didn't fall out until probably 2000. Well, we got indicted in three and five to about 2003. Everything was, I mean, they were, you know, they still were. Meech was in Atlanta, T was in LA, but everything was, you know, they were still connected. You know, and I know it was around 2003 because my brother got killed around that time. My brother got killed in 2003. And that's when all the trauma and everything started happening. And um, so I, I was trying to get, keep them together, you know, because I knew they were like a yin and a yang and they needed each other. And by that, all this drama, people, people pull at you. People divide and conquer. People was in his ear. People was in his ear. And so I'm steady trying to keep them together because I've been to this rodeo a bunch of times. I'm older. I feel the energy. I know what's going on. I'm watching these people. I'm watching the room. And I tell Terry, if y'all don't come back together, we're going to go to prison. You got to get come back together. And I push that all the time. And like I said, I lost my brother. And I always would tell him, like, you would never know missing somebody like that until they're gone. You know, me and my brother were best, best friends. We did everything together. Like, so when I got, when that loss, when I lost, when I got that loss, it was devastating. So I knew the feeling and I knew how much they loved each other. So I was always trying to pull them back together, but it's always people, you know, people pulling them apart, pulling them apart. Cause people, they felt like if they kept them apart, they could get more. They could, you know, um, stand closer and become, you know, like maybe the next in line. And it was just, and by them not being apart, you can't really see what's going on no more. It was too many people involved and too many people in, in their ears. Yeah. Well, well I mean, from, from what I understand from, you know, things I read and people I talked to, there was somewhat of a competition between the two of them. And they'd get into these big arguments and the arguments would... But you know, that's sibling into, rivalry, it, though. Who don't do that? And my my boys do it. I mean, I mean, it right. was a crazier because it was so much money involved and so much, and you know, the power. Once your power, once you start growing and you get more powerful, yeah, you butt more. You know, your heads butt more. But that was all the time, and it, it's something I was used to. But at that time, now, like, look, we're too big for this right now. So it made me more nervous than anybody else because I know the loss. The loss was going to, we were going to feel that loss more than anybody else, you know? Right. Well, from what I understand also, T had a problem with how flashy Meech was. You know, T was more low key. Meech was the, you know, the billboards, the world is BMF, the cover of the magazines, the videos, you know, the the massive parties with pictures and photos and, and everything else like that, the starting of the the rap label. And and T always felt like this is gonna end up getting us busted 
and and there was like a friction between the two of them, between the way they operated. Is that accurate? Yeah, because, you know, when I met T, T was very quiet, very introverted. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He didn't do any of that, you know. Um, And so he didn't like all that flashy stuff, not just because of that. Even when I met him, he didn't like all that flashy stuff, you know. Um, He just wasn't into it. And he liked to be more, you know, he was just like a home, more a homebody. Like, I just want to make this money and go home, take care of you, take care of my kids, take care of your kids, and this is what we're going to do. He didn't like all that. He liked to see his money stack, 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 stack. He liked looking at it, you know. He liked putting it on himself, spending on him and spending on the people he loved. You know, he didn't like all that going to the strip club and throwing all the money away and stuff like that. He thought that was crazy, you know, and he would always complain about that. So, I mean, they're two different people, you know. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, it kind of bothered him. It worried him a lot. Right. And I guess at one point there was a trip to DR where they went to go party with uh, with Puffy where something, some argument happened. And then after that, you know, they went back to Dallas and they split the crew up where basically it was Big Meech had BMF and T had a 263. I don't know. I don't know about that. That's kind of, okay. that, I mean, we did go on a trip like that, but I I think people that even, what they weren't even there. It was me, Meech and his girlfriend and me and T and Puffy and all his people. So people, they tell these stories that they assume will happen, but that didn't happen there. We had a, that trip was a good trip, nice trip. We had fun. We Everybody came home. They went their separate ways. It didn't happen there. You know, it was okay. it was building up, but that trip was a great trip. Got it. Okay. So by 2002, BMF became one of the biggest sellers of cocaine in, in America, essentially. They were like the Costco of, of drug distribution, essentially. Yeah. I was like, whew. one day I was like, who the fuck we working for now? Because it was just, it was so much, so much money, so much, so much, so much, and really fast. You know, and and this was the El Chapo connect. That was I don't know like who that connect over. was. I can't even tell you at that time. T, I was so I didn't I wasn't involved in it, so I don't know who the connect was. I don't know who it was. I just know that it was m- massive. You know, and um, that's that's all I know. I couldn't. I don't know faces. I don't know any of that. I was out of touch with that. I I did. Me and T did everything together. You know, um, but that part, he was like, after he got that connect from me and he grew, he was, he had always told me, like, once I get on, you ain't gonna ever have to do this again. You ain't gonna never have to look back. You ain't gonna never have to do this. I had been doing it for so long. You know, it was always, you know, that you always, people don't understand, you know, it's, it's a hard life. You always gotta, you know, a lot of sleepless nights, you know, you can't sleep the connect don't come pick up the drugs or the money you still got it you got can't sleep you walking from window from window you don't know if they come in the police come and the people come in it was just a hard life you know when I look back on it, I don't even know how I did it how I went through it you know it was times that I had millions of dollars in my basement you know for weeks and wondering like damn where they where they at did they get caught up you don't know if to call you don't know what to do that life you know it was hard you know even though I went through it like I said I was young I had the nerves of steel but it was a hard life you know yeah yeah I bet well because at one point you guys started the car company uh, Oracle Motors- Motorsports yeah I started was... a car company before that though me and my dad started oh, okay that's the car company that they mentioned in stars and at the season eight that was me and my dad's car company then we moved to California we started another car company got it Got it. And that was essentially a drug front and a money laundering organization? No, I I really wanted that company to be legitimate. I really ran it like a legitimate company. We even went out and got loans for the company. That's how legitimate I wanted it to be. I didn't want any of that in it. You know, I wanted to learn the business. I wanted to do the business. I wanted to have, you know, do everything by the book. But unfortunately, when you in that life, 
they make it seem like everything that you do, some kind of money you got from here came from drug proceeds, even if it's a wheel or tire, or anything that they can connect to it, it becomes a part of that um, that life. Got it. Got it. Okay. So then 2003 rolls around and BMF essentially explodes. Uh, and that's Atlanta becomes kind of like the hub. Yeah. You know, for, mm-hmm. for the drug distribution. And Big Meech sets up in Atlanta and it's I mean, it basically becomes, it's crazy. You know, like right around 2004, um, which was, you know, right around the time that BMF flew me out as a DJ, as DJ (laughs) Vlad, to just go party with them because they're trying to launch their label. And I'm looking around and it's like, it's like nothing I've ever seen. There was billboards that say the world is BMFs. Um, You know, there's parties with BMF ice sculptures, (laughs) you know, and they're giving out Cristal bottles like they're flyers. Like that was the first time I got to drink Cristal. And, you know, and I think things were going well, but right around that time, that's when uh, Wolf, you know, who was Puffy's bodyguard, ends up getting into it with Meech in Atlanta over a girl, over a stripper. And they go outside, a shootout happens, and Wolf and Rizzo gets killed. Um, Meech gets shot. Um, and I remember that's when I was there because Meech was on house arrest. You know, he had the ankle monitor on. I was at Meech's house, you know, with his mom. They were cooking dinner and everyone was hanging out. Um, and everyone had free Meech shirts on and so forth. You know, ultimately the charges were dropped against BMF. But I felt like that was the moment when it was all on the radar. Suddenly, you know, everyone's looking at the situation because now there's two bodies. Was that a turning point in BMF? From your point of view? I think so. I think so, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, because you, you got two bodies now, you know. And I think when you think of mafias, you think of, I was just watching Goodfellas and all of them the other day. And you see all the killings and everything that's going on in it. And me and T always said that as long as, you know, you don't start killing people and doing all that, we are, we probably get a long way. But when you start bringing all the killings in and that's when the radar, I mean, what are you going to do? It does. It bring, and you have these two high-profile people that got killed that day, which was very unfortunate. I don't, you know, I knew the young lady who they got into it with, and I don't, I wouldn't say she was a stripper. I, you know, I don't. And I think Wolf was really in love with that with her. We all just had a trip together overseas. We were all Americanish, and so you know, um, he was in his feelings about that. It was his girl, and that's why I think men should speak up and say, you know, when that's your girl, say that's your girl. You know, so other people would know that's off limits. And whatever it is, I think that they should have knew that that was off limits. And and you got a lot of emotions in it. You got drugs in it. You got alcohol. And it just, you know, got, I mean, unfortunately that happened. And at the end of the day, I thought we all were friends, you know. It was a sad, sad yeah. situation. Very sad. Oh, yeah, no, I had heard from people that were there that they they were begging Wolf, like, to just, hey, just chill out. It's not a big yeah. deal. Like, this is, you know, just come in, have a drink. It's not worth escalating. Like, they didn't want to get into it with him like no. that. But then I think, like, when they went outside, he was, like, sitting on one of their cars, and they, he pulled out on them and started shooting at them first, and they returned fire, and then, yeah. you know, very emotional. You, know, you end up with two people dead. Two people um, dead, yeah. And then there was a, a series of, of violent incidents where, where BMF was kind of tied into it. Uh, I guess there was a situation at the Velvet Room where there's a guy named Prince who got killed by this guy named um, Fleming uh, Ill Daniels. Uh, you, you know, I guess they had uh, backed up a car and they ended up, you know, bumping into his car and then argument happened, a warning shot went off, and then this guy ends up, the guy who did the warning shot ends up getting killed. Yeah. See, I, you know? I was very out of touch with that. Like I said, I was in LA. I was taking care of my children. I was trying to uh, legitimize my life. You know, I've always wanted, okay, this is enough. This is too much. You know, let's just 
stop all this because it was getting too out of hand. It was when you have so many people, you can't even, you know, you don't even know who half these people are. So you know, you know, you feel, you know, these things are going to happen because people tend to want to prove themselves. You know, they want to do something. And when it's too many people, you can't control everybody. It's too much. It's too much. Too many. You don't know what everybody's going to do. You can't handle everybody, you know. So I don't even really know that situation, but to me, I, I wanted to stay away from it. Right, because then there was a situation where, uh, you know, th these two guys, uh, Shane and Kelsey uh, Brown, they were nephews of Bobby Brown. They got stabbed in the neck with an ice pick uh, by uh, this guy, Baby Blue, who was Blue Da Vinci's younger brother. Mm -hmm. And, you know... Yeah, it was that just was like a, a, tr a domino effect of things. A domino happening. effect, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. it was well, just very were, unfortunate. Were kind of, yeah, it was just it was just happening. Some out of control, but that's why I say when you get you start growing, you get all this money, you get you know people getting their egos, and you got drugs involved, people taking drugs, all this alcohol, those things happen. You know. Yeah. Right, because they're saying right around that time. BMF was making about twenty million a week. That's what I heard. <laughs> yeah, that's what I uh, heard. I mean, I believe it based I mean, on what it, I, I saw. Mean, like, yeah, I mean, it wasn't anything like I, you know, like you look back, you know, it's not to glamorize it, but it pretty much did what we wanted to do. It was, you know, you could do what you wanted to do. You know, you wanted to jump on a jet go to the store, buy what you wanted to buy. And, you know, that was, so that took a lot of money. And then you don't yeah. realize how much money it is. You know it's, you, you're accessible to it, but you don't know until when they start getting raids and stuff like, and they're telling you what they're finding, you know, what they're coming up with. And once you're realizing the money you have around your house and you have on you is a lot. Yeah. You know? Well, at one point, uh, Jacob the jeweler got dragged into this whole situation as well. I guess Southwest T had bought a bunch of uh, jewelry from Jacob. And then and I remember I read the book about this. And you can kind of correct me if I'm wrong. But I guess he was driving uh, someplace. He got pulled over. They confiscated all this jewelry, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And instead of saying, okay, we'll just take this loss... Jacob tried to get the jewelry back. And when they looked into the jewelry, because I guess you have to, when you spend a certain amount of money, it has to be registered with the government, right? Right. And I guess Jacob wasn't registering these, these jewelry sales. He was just doing it somewhat under the table. So in the process of trying to get this jewelry back from the feds, now they start investigating Jacob. And now he's dragged into the whole conspiracy yeah. aspect I think of he it. was it, dragged into it. I don't think... Um, Jacob was, you know, uh, aware of what, so, I mean, people hear about it, but, you know, just like a lot of people, they thinking like you doing this music, you're doing this, you're promoting, uh, I'll say here, it's very unfortunate to what happened to him. He was kind of dragged into it also, you know, um, I don't know if he, if he was paying his taxes, I don't know if he wasn't. You know, I just know he got indicted later on in an indictment and he ended up doing some time. Right, because I guess it was $4 million with the jewelry that got confiscated. $4 million. Terry was very high end. He was like, that's what I said. When he, he, when he bought things for himself or people he loved or myself or me, it was, oh, it was really top, you know, the, Whatever it is, I don't. I don't want to see a spot in a diamond. What is that? VVS, clear everything. One on one watches. He was a collector of all those things, and so it was a yeah. So when they took his jury, it was you know probably the number you're saying is probably correct. I can believe that. Right, because I guess Terry tried to say that the jewelry belonged to Damon Thomas, who I guess was Kim Kardashian's husband <laughs> yeah. at the time. Damon Thomas went along with it and said, yes, that's my jewelry. Yes. Which got him tied into the whole BMF thing. Yes. And then he turned around 
actually he turned T on Terry on to uh, to Jacob. So we were they were all going back that way. He turned around and Toe started telling on Terry. So he told he I got the grand jury papers and all that. He's the indictment. Um, I got all his testimonies. Uh, he turned around and told on Jacob and told on Terry. <laughs> the Kim Kardashian connection to yeah. BMF. Yeah. Well, a lot Poor of Damon. Don't you know. know, you know, like when Damon, me and Damon were friends before all of this. And and I was telling Damon, you know, Damon used to come by the house and we used to hang out. Like, Damon, this is not the life for you. You know, don't do it. Cause I, you know, like you say, it's just like you, you talk to people, you know, you get a feel for people. You not this is not your lifestyle. You right. might not want to get involved in this. It's because if something happened, you know, you you not you can't take this heat. And, right. you know, so that's, I, you know, I don't even blame them because he shouldn't even have been around. He should have stuck to what he what he did. Music, you know, so right. the, it's a lot of people that got dragged into something that they wasn't built for. You know, like I was in it since I've been 19. So I knew kind of. I, I became built for it. I knew what could happen. I seen things. I seen a lot of things, you know. And, but you had these people who just be had this greed and want to be a part of this life and want to jump in it. And they don't even know what this takes. And when the heat comes, you can't stand the heat. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's exactly how I felt when I was when I partied with BMF. Yeah. It was like I'm looking, I'm looking around going like, okay, it's obvious what's happening here. Like, like from my point of view white kid from the suburbs, it's totally obvious that this is not music money. Right. You know what I mean? Like, no records are being sold. There's no hit singles. Like, no. Clearly, clearly, this is all, this is yeah. all drug money. And as much as it was fun to hang out with these guys, and I was really broke at the time. Mm -hmm. I said, I said, I, I, I don't want to be caught when, when everything goes bad. Right. And, you know, right. I, I have to wear a wire and I'm going to be facing years just for affiliation. I said, I'll just politely separate myself. Separate yourself. And, Go go back to doing my music thing, and right. sure enough, you know what I thought would happen would ultimately, unfortunately, did happen. But but I was completely separated from it because I knew that I wasn't built for this game. Yeah, like it was it was too much for me. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know and and the money wasn't going to be worth it for me. So, okay, so essentially these these dominoes are falling. People are getting killed. People are getting busted. Millions of jewelry, dollars of jewelry is getting confiscated. The feds had actually been investigating, you know, for two years. I guess there was, there was a special uh, force, force called Operation Motor City Mafia. I didn't hear about that. <laughs> you didn't hear about that? That's yeah. new. Yeah. You're yeah. telling me something. Okay. Operation Motor City Mafia was a special DEA, a special division that has started essentially putting all this together. Um, and there was wiretaps everywhere. And... Southwest T was caught on a lot of wiretaps. Uh, I remember there was an interview that a uh, Cavario did with, with big Meech uh, from prison. And, and the one thing that Meech said was that Terry was just in love with the phone. I, I listened to those wiretaps too, you know, but I mean, okay. but if, if you, if you are an investigator, you can say what you want to say that certain things meant, you know, um, like one time he did, we were talking about something and it totally didn't mean what they said it meant, you know? So I didn't hear anything that he, you know, maybe I missed that part. Maybe I didn't hear it in the tape. So maybe it, it, I don't know because that's not my job to know that part, what they're picking and saying. But I didn't see, I mean, it was one conversation where he was saying about his brother being, you know, um, out of control. And they, everybody makes a big deal out of that. But I don't think he did. He didn't do it to, you know, to put his us and nobody else in harm. He was just like, you know, bending like, look, you know, we're getting out of control. He felt it. You know, he felt the energy. He He's getting pulled over. He's seeing, he's hearing things. People are getting totally busted. So, yeah, that conversation, but a lot of other conversations, yeah. And then, yeah, he, I mean, a lot of times I would be like, get off the phone. Get off the phone, you know. Yeah. I just I'm not, I'm not like a phone person like that. And he was like always on it, but I think he was just in general talking. It was a time where they said that um the prosecutor said that I warned him about a phone. I don't know if you heard that part. In which I did because I could hear it in the phone. 
And that's when she said, well, she knew everything because she was always doing this and she was always, but I could hear it in the phone. And I was like, well, where are you? And he said, where it was at? And I said, well, roll down the window and throw that bitch out. Hmm. And he didn't do it. He held on to that phone. And that was kind of. Yeah. Well, I guess one of the wiretaps, I guess uh, Southwest T was talking to his sister mm -hmm. about Meech. And he said, uh, my brother better knock it off before he gets knocked off. No. You think the way, you think that, and I don't even know why people picked that. He's not saying he would knock him off or nobody else would knock him off. He probably was talking about this, the government or something. Terry loves his brother. They love each other, no matter what nobody say. You know, people say, oh, he was going to kill his brother. That's that's stupid. That's ridiculous. You know, like, why would he, 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 he out of the whole time he was in the streets, he's never killed anyone, never, you know, uh, people running off, people doing this and people doing that. He wasn't that type of person, let alone kill people, that I'm going to kill my brother. That's, that's crazy. It was a crazy thought. I think he was just venting. And well, I know he was venting. And he was just like, yeah, yeah I can't control him. Maybe you can control him. You know, why? And you're talking to people that really don't care because if they cared, they would be like, okay, let me figure this out. You know, even my mom was trying to figure it out. Like, hey, what are y'all doing? You know, so yeah. that you have so many people that didn't care because I, I'm, why y'all not talking? I can come over here and get money from here and I can go and nobody would know the difference. Somebody even told me that I'm getting more money like this. And their family. I'm getting more money like this. But in the meantime, this is hurting us. This is hurting the people that's involved. You know? Right. I mean, in terms of hurting people that's involved, at one point, your son, your first, uh, your firstborn, Marlon, he ends up getting into drug dealing. And then Southwest T kind of pulls him into BMF in a way. Yeah. But either way, he was going to do it on his own. My son, I think, you know, just like he always grew up in a life. You're talking about something he grew up in. And that, you know, most times it would, which your kids see, they kind of, they, most times they follow. If I was a doctor, they might have been a doctor. If I was a lawyer, they might. But here I am. I'm a drug dealer mother. So my kids followed me. My Well, in statistics wise, they say that's what happened. But not only that he followed me, I had two nephews that followed me. I had a cousin that followed me and a young boy that was my son's best friend that was my neighbor that was at my house every, every day that followed me. So when, we, when I went to prison, it, I took five people to prison with me. You know, so that's when they say that, talk about who I am or what I should be or anything like that. Five people in my family that I was responsible for and that I had to walk that prison yard and hold that regret and, and live in shame because I led five people to prison. Even though I apologize deeply to them, they always say, it's not your fault, but I had to feel that. My soul had yeah. to feel that. All right, because then by 2005, that's when the feds pretty much lined up their cases and then that's when the raids started to happen. Uh, 30 BMF members were arrested in a relatively short period of time. Stash houses everywhere were raided. Uh, $3 million in cash was seized. Southwest T and Big Meech uh, were both arrested. Uh, the feds claimed that the BMF was moving 2,500 kilos of cocaine a month throughout the U.S. And then they had a, a network of 25,000 people that were either BMF members or associates or, or so forth. How many members? Um, I'm sorry? How many members? <laughs> they said in terms of members and associates, 25,000. Who said that? What the Fed say. That's the Fed what the say. Fed, you read that somewhere? I read that, yeah. But they only arrested, we, we, what, how many that got indicted and went to prison? Uh, I mean, originally it was 30. I mean, by the time Yeah, the I was settled, in the first indictment. Yeah, by the time the dust settled, I think it was it was closer maybe to 100. 200, yeah. Uh, mm. 200, yeah. Yeah, there you go. But it was it was a mess. Um, your son gets indicted. And then the feds raid your house. No, they raided me first. I was in the first okay. 30. I was in the first 30. Oh, okay, got it. Okay, sorry. I, I, I was one of the first okay, so women that was indicted. I was in the first 30 in indictment. So why T and Meech were already in county in a hold, in a hold up, they came and raided everybody. They came to the house and raided me and got me. 
Okay, did you know that the Meech and Terry were already arrested by the time they raided you? Yeah, they were. They had been arrested. I think uh, uh, probably prior, like a week, a week or two, and we mm -hmm. were trying to fight to get them out. But talking to the attorneys, they knew. You know, one of the attorneys that I had hired, he was telling me that that this is weird. That they're not giving him a bond. Something's about to go down. Mm. And so, well, you know, and, and this is one of the questions that, that were brought up, I think, when, when Kavario interviewed Meech was, you know, everyone knew this was probably coming, right? Like, like people are getting killed, like, you know, arrests are coming in, there's, there's wiretaps, there's this and that. You guys are sitting on millions and millions of dollars. And was there a conversation between you and Terry of like, hey, listen, Let's just go somewhere where there's no extradition with the U.S. Let's just take our millions, take our family, and then just get out of here because we know what's going to come. Well, and you, when it does come, it's going to be ugly. Yeah, I think we we had those talks, but we didn't talk about running or doing anything like that. But at the time, you're thinking that, okay, let's just sit back. We're going to sit back. We're not going to make no movements. We're not going to do anything. So you're hoping I was hoping that it would kind of, you know, because we don't had these scares before, especially me and Terry. We don't had a scare before. And what we did, we just laid low for a while. And it kind of went away. And it was, you know, that was when I was involved. I was living in Detroit. I was in Southfield. And we laid low for a minute. And it kind of just like, okay, went away. So you thinking if you pull back again, this will happen. But I knew that it was too big. But that's something like, you know, it's just not us now. We don't, I don't know what everybody else is doing. So the only thing I was thinking was that I hadn't sold drugs in a while, that I wasn't really involved, you know. I was trying to always cover myself to stay out of it, you know, like, ooh, I made it out of the life, you know. Like I said, I've been in that life for a long time. I thought I made it out of the life. But what people don't understand is or what a lot of people don't understand, they taking everybody now. The girlfriends going, the kids going, everybody can go. And a lot of these girls, they don't even know that anytime you spend anything, you sign for anything, that puts you involved. You When you're sleeping with that person, it puts you involved. And... um yeah, I guess I thought, you know, same thing like with Harold that I was going to skate through. But once my son and my nephews got indicted, that who, who I raised, I understood. I said, you know what? I, I did go in prison angry. But when I when I thought about it, you know, like I skate, even if I didn't do anything in BMF life, you know, I, I was the start of that. I handed them these drugs. So if I didn't get caught for that, I did do something all through my life. So I had to take responsibility, even that my kids were involved. You know, my nephews were my kids. I raised them. So they were involved. So I had to go to prison if I hadn't sold nothing in 2000 because I'm just as responsible. Right. Right. Because when you get arrested, you were facing a minimum of 10 years to life in prison. Your son gets arrested uh, he's facing up to 15 years. No, he was facing up to the same. He was facing up to 20, 20 years. Okay. My nep, yeah. Oh. Everybody was facing a minimum of 20 years. Right. So, you know, you have to sit here as a relatively young person and say life. <laughs> you know, you have to get your head around that. Um, and you have to deal with your son dealing with something similar. You have kids... You know, you have a younger son, you know, from Harold, who is still uh, a minor at He's this point. He's a minor, you yeah. You have, it's, it's, a, it's really a mess really. that's happening. Um, you know, and then, then in 2007, Meech and Terry, they pled guilty to running a continuing uh, criminal enterprise. They took 30 years each. Uh, you ended up pleading guilty and getting seven years. Well, I Which, pleaded to seven, but what happened yeah. was when I went to uh, went to court to plea and get my sentence accepted by the judge, the judge changed it. The judge said he didn't feel that um, that I did in this time enough to uh, accept that plea. He said, I'm not going to accept that plea. He said, I feel like you were 
a victim to your circumstances, all the abuse. I, I mean, it's public record that he said, you know what? Because of, I, I think it's the burning bed syndrome. I can't think of what that law was. He gave me an extra time off of that. I got 18 more months off of that. I ended up being sentenced to 57 months. Right. Yeah. Five years. Five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your son got 11 to 15 years? My son got 11 and a half. My nephew got 10. My other nephew got eight. My cousin got 13. And um, my son's best friend got eight. Right. Um, Blue Da Vinci uh, got sentenced to five years and four months in 2008. Um, you end up going to prison and, you know, essentially you got 18 months off your sentence. So you end up doing 30 months. You get out in 2012. Right. And at this point you're broke. But broke. I had uh, what I had. I only thing I had. I said nothing. I uh, people had done ran through ransack, took everything. I had a house. I had said the judge let me keep a house that I had, and because um, I didn't buy it with the proceeds of that, I ended up buying a house. I said if I didn't have anything else, I'll have a home to come to when I got out of prison. At least my sons, when he get out of college here, yeah, they'll have somewhere to come. In, while I was in prison, people who call themselves your friends, they um, ripped me off. I came home homeless. Yeah, which is a story I hear all the time with, you know, people in the drug business that, that I've interviewed. Um, you know, like Freeway Ricky left a bunch of homes in people's names. And my home was in my name. They just stole my whole identity. They stole my whole oh, identity. Yeah. They didn't care nothing about my life. They didn't care nothing about my son's life. My younger sons, I had two younger sons. They didn't give a, they didn't care nothing about them. These people was I I took care of their kids when their mother died. I took care of their mothers, funerals, all kinds of things, you know. Took care of them all the way until I went to prison and came home homeless. Yeah, was and like I said, this is always a typical story. You know, whatever money you leave with people, they'll spend it. They'll spend you know, it if, and did get mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. get mad at and, you. You know, and like, you know, like yeah, Freeway Ricky, you know, allegedly left a bunch of property in other people's names and they weren't gonna transfer it back once he got out. Uh, you know, there's always a reason why they needed it more than him. And and ultimately you got out in the same situation where everything you built up and had you blown through fifty million dollars? Is that what what they said in, in BET? <laughs> that they said five hundred million, but I think it that five hundred million. Okay. That was exaggerated thought. But I mean, when you look back, and I look back at some of the things, it, it wasn't that. I blew a lot of money though. I like I'm saying like a fool with money. I'm like the things <laughs> yeah. that I think about, the things that I had, the things when you look back at it. But I thought, you know, like I said, ill gotten gains. You know, like. It was off of people hardship, so I'm okay. I feel good about my life now. You know that yeah. everything I do now, I work hard for it. Well, and then in 2020, uh, Southwest T gets out of prison early. You know, uh, due to COVID, and I guess he met up with you and basically apologized for everything that he did, and ultimately you forgave him. How did it feel when you first saw him? You know. Because at that point, you hadn't seen him for how many years? 15. 15 years. So for the first time in 15 years, the, the guy that you were close to, that you lived with, that helped take care of your kids, and you know you started him in the drug business and, and, and so forth. And, and you, I guess you blamed him somewhat for your son going to prison? It wasn't just my son. It was just so much. It was other things that... You know, when you get into a relationship and we made each other promises that we wouldn't do to each other. And he broke a lot of those promises. So it wasn't just really my son. It was just a lot of different things that could have happened that that happened that couldn't that shouldn't have happened. That, you know, I just thought that my life would have been set up differently. We always had plans. Well, if something happened, you know, um, when I came into his life, you know, it, I felt like I made sure your kids was good. I told him, you know, like I had, it, it was no, 
no insecurities that I had at all. I wanted him, his family to have what I had. You know, that's why I started helping him. You know, like he wanted to help his mother. He wanted to, you know, like, okay, I'm going to help you so you can help your mother. You know, I you need to get your kids out of, you know, out of their, their grandma's house. They need to go to this. They need to do this. And it was just so much that I was blind. I was so blindsided by the time I got to prison and listening to all these wiretaps. And that's why that I was mad because. You would do somebody like I felt like you did me. I felt like he did me so wrong. Not in just about my son, just the whole thing that we made promises no matter what. You know, I felt like you were my friend. You somebody I told my deepest secrets to. You know, and and that trust was just so. When when I was listening to the tapes and listening to people, and I was out there by myself. And everybody was going against me. Everybody was going against me. Every Even people that I helped was going against me. And I felt like I blamed him for that. I felt he didn't protect me. Yeah. Well, the two of you ultimately worked it out. He actually showed up on your uh, Yeah. That you know, was surprising. I didn't even know he was going to do that. And that, that made dope. me feel good because, like I said, a lot of people thought that I was there for the ride, you know? But yeah. I, Robert, I wasn't there for the ride. Yeah. Your son Marlon gets out of prison as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and ultimately, you know, as you're doing now, you start with the rebuilding process. Uh, you know, a legitimate rebuilding process in terms of, of what you're doing. Um, I interviewed uh, Dexter uh, Sosa Hussey, uh, you know, uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And I guess in the interview, he had said some things about you that you want to address. Yeah, he said some things like I brought down the organization. He was one of the ones that said I was uh, alone for the ride, um, that I I was a rat. You know, like, Dexter, you don't even know me. You know, I couldn't have been alone for the ride. I, You know, when I met all of them, I was already, to me, I was already made in my level. You know, I had money. I, I I put them on. I came on. I didn't come for the ride. I came. I was a, a assess. You know, it, I wasn't no liability. You know, I felt like you. You know, just because I looked at Dexter like you were nobody to me. You know, I don't. I don't. I didn't even want to. Me and him didn't even have a com. We didn't a conversation when I when Dexter got out. I think Dexter did less than me because he was a driver. He always, I always looked at Dexter as just somebody from the neighborhood they hired as to be a driver. He lived in his mother's home. But to blame me for all of that, like I'm a woman. Why do you need to blame me? Why did you feel like you need to bully me? He told me, I did have a conversation with him. I'm like, what is this all about? You want to sue me? He wanted to sue me for using the name. You know, I started when I came home from prison, I was, uh, uh, you know, I, Got a deal to do a show. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, 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 no, BMF I, I, Wives, I the Trap Queens one. No, when I came home in 2012, I end up shopping around and doing a deal. I end up. Mm-hmm. It wasn't supposed to be BMF Wives, but it came out to be BMF Wives. And uh, okay. I and he was telling me I was gonna have to take care of his niece, and I'm like, Why am I gonna have to take care of your niece? I'm coming home, home. So I'm, I'm rebuilding. You take care of your niece. She got a daddy. She got a mama. She got a grandma. In fact, she got two grandmas. She's not even my blood. Why do I? I mean, she's a nice young woman. But why did he feel like I had to take care of her? I had my own family to take care of. You know, I'm out here trying to grind myself. And everything that I was doing, Dexter from the family to everybody else was just bumping my head. I came home from prison. I had a deal with... um. A, a television network. I called the people that I thought was involved. I said, hey, Meech, I got this deal. What girl you want to bring onto the show? Hey, Wayne, you know, it, the top people that I thought that would make the show be good. And in doing this show, everybody was just like, oh, who she thinks she is? What's she doing? You know, um, they, uh, that's, I don't know if you heard the story about Tammy Cohen. I haven't. Okay. You, you can well, explain it. I'm explaining the story. Tammy Cohen is now the executive producer of um, the BMF Star Show, the BMF Star Show. She has Meech rights. 
I was doing this show. So when T was locked up, T asked me to call her. I blindly called her. And she just immediately went off on me. Like, what the hell? You know, I'm on probation. By this time, it was like 2014, 13, 14. And the next day after that conversation, I get called down to my uh, probation officer. I'm looking at my young son because this has never happened to me. I've been on probation a couple of years now, like, what's going on? So I told my, no, my youngest son went there. I called him. I said, hey, come over here. I got a, um, my probation officer called me. I got to go turn my, turn, you know, go turn myself in. Not turn myself in. I said, I got to go see her. And he said, what's going on? I said, I don't know. She told me, she's giving me an hour to get there. I get down to my probation officer, my son in the car. I said, if I don't come out, in a couple of hours, call the lawyer. I get in there. Tammy Cohen um, is a government informant. So she says, so the D, my probation officer is sitting there and, a, and some other guy. I, don't, I can't remember his name, but I just knew he was part of the DEA. And he had that come in. I go in. I'm like, fuck. You know, this is everybody's nightmare. I, I already did my time. Only thing I wanted to come do home and do is take care of myself, take care of my family, make amends for my mother, redeem myself through, you know, the world or anybody that I felt like I affected. So they told me, he says, um, you know what that's about? And I said, no. He said, well, um, you threatened a government informant and that's a, that's a federal offense. And it's plus it's a violation of your probation. And I said, well, who did I threaten? I don't know what you're talking about. So he go over the story, and I'm sitting there, and I'm telling you, when pe I've heard of people killing themselves not to go back to prison. I went to prison, man. I went to prison. When I say I came home, and all these people were going at my head, all these people I helped, all these people, I'm a, I'm a mother. I was somebody's daughter. I lost my father, lost my mother. You know, I was somebody's daughter. And here you are. You didn't, you didn't put in no work. No work. All you do is all you did is start writing a man. And this man befriended you, gave you his life rights. And just because you've been a government informant since 2008, you had the right to tell them that I threatened you. I went on, they told me that I was going, I was going to, um, they were going to arrest me. They were going to charge me. I'm in there. I'm hyperventilating. I'm in this little room with, you know, they shut the door. It's no knob on this side because if, I, if you wanted to run, you couldn't get out. They're talking to me. I'm had to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm just like fear. I, Fear had set through my body. I couldn't like, I'm going to prison. This woman is finished to take me. Take my life away from me. Take my whole life. I did my time. Out of them 200 people, okay, none of them said I'm on their paperwork. I did my time. I came home broke. I lost everything I had before I even went to prison, even before I met these two, Terry and his brother. So everything I had, everything I gained, I lost. It's okay because of, of my lifestyle. But who would give a person the right to tell another person to lock me back up because I came home to figure out another way to make money. This been hunting me for years. So eventually this had this hunted, this stayed over my head for about a year. My father had stage four cancer. I thought I wasn't going, they told me I couldn't go home to visit him. Eventually the case went away because they put it under investigation. She couldn't prove what I did. Uh, proved that I threatened her. And then after that, she has did interviews about me. Like her and Sasha was going at my head. But what reason? I don't even know y'all. Have done multiple interviews about me. Talking about who I am. Like, no, who are you? So I thought that when we were coming here, I I know like Blue and they had this big thing on Instagram and going, that conversation was about her. Yes, she's a government informant. 
Yes, she's been a, a, a government informant since 2008. Yes, she tried to get me locked back up. But before my, uh, my attorney and my probation officer, I would, I, they didn't lock me back up. But can you imagine the fear that I, my son had, my mother had, and my dying father had? Because I, I, anytime you're in prison, you always think, I just want to make it home to my parents because my parents were older. just want to make it home to my parents so I can make it right. But for somebody to take your freedom, because I vowed while I was sitting in prison that I vowed to be forgiving to anybody that I hurt, anybody that, you know, got hurt in anything that I was doing. I vowed to give back. That's why I started Side and Heart, give back to the community, help the community. I vowed to help people in, in who's locked up, you know, for these Unjust laws. I've helped people come home from prison. I helped three people come home from prison, working in prison form, reform. So when a person, just because you have that right, because you you making money from the government, it ain't like me or like any other woman. I was in prison with 600 women at a time. I've heard multiple stories. I don't blame those women who got caught up and might have had to take the stand and tell and get a little time so they can run home to get to their kids. But when you have a woman that's like dirt ball, piece of shit ass woman that sits there and make money from the government and say, oh, because I'm a government informant, I could take your fucking freedom away from you. Prison is like almost death. You can't go no farther down. It's prison, then it's dying or it's dying to be in prison. So when you do this kind of thing, you fuck up people's life. So when I had this show, here I go again, trying to help everybody around me. This happened. I had to walk away from that. I walked away from that. I had to walk away. My probation officer said, we going to make a deal with you. We're going to investigate this, but you're going to have to walk away from anything that you got going on with them. So I walked away from that was a way for me to take care of myself when I came home from prison. Struggle, struggle for years. Here it come before the BMF show come. Everybody going at my head. Tammy Cohen again started doing these interviews. I get a book deal. Here they come with this whole story again. What is this? What is this? Why is this woman? I want to know. I want you to put this piece in this because I really want to know. I want her to face me. I want her to face the world like when she put out these interviews for me. I want her to feel like she made me feel when I had to go back, almost go back to prison. I want to know why did you do that? What could I, I don't even, I didn't even know who she was. I used to look her up, look her up. Because when you're a government informant, they, you don't have no identity. They wipe, you don't have a Facebook, you don't have an Instagram, you don't have LinkedIn, you don't have anything. And I was asking people, who is this person? Who is this person? When they did the BMF Stars premiere, I, w I was on Instagram and I seen her for the first time. Nobody had to tell me. My, I looked at her and I knew it was her. All these people from BMF and everybody, they just all hugged up with this person. Do you know how that make me feel like this is a government informant? I'm y'all 30 something year friend. Wow, I'm not, I don't even have to be a friend. I should have been somebody you respect. You don't have to love me. You don't have to like me. But I don't even, I don't know nobody that I will put in prison. Nobody. I'm not, I don't even hate nobody that bad. And then you guys sit around and y'all argue with Blue about who he is or what he did to anybody else, and y'all upholding this piece of shit-ass woman, holding her up like she's somebody. So people ought to know that when you're going around certain people, you need to realize who who you, who you standing next to, who you're getting involved, because really the street code is that we don't do this. We don't do government informants. We don't do rats. I'm sorry. I got a no, little. That's okay. But, you know, but when you keep trying to take people live like the way that the, they livelihood, 
I have to reinvent myself. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I could go get a job that, to making thirty, forty dollars an hour what I would need to take care of me. I had to reinvent myself. I had to come up with something. I had to brand myself. I had to work my ass off when everybody at my head because oh, this but you didn't buy me a house. You didn't buy me a car. I ain't nobody. But uh, Terry bought that stuff for me, or Hero bought that stuff for me, or I hustled myself. So you got to do it to yourself. But when it came to, did I give you money? Did I take care? Did I make? Did I look out for you? Did I make sure your kids went to? They got out of their mama house, went to private school, and they and I said, oh, get them a house. And you, how dare you say you hate me? You don't even know me. How dare you hate me enough to put me back in, to get me back in, to put me back in, 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 in somewhere where you feel, I mean, t- my, take my life away, take my freedom away. Or somebody to take my livelihood. I'm not even messing with none of these people. I'm, a, I'm so far away from these people. Why, are, why, why would somebody do that? So, yeah. So I, I went back to her and, and Saucer. I don't even know y'all like that. Saucer, you get on my new show and now I'm the best person in the world. What, why, why are you jumping around? You know, what are you doing? You know, you're a grown man. You're a 50-something-year-old man. Why are you doing this? You wanted to sue me. You wanted to, you, you tore down my reputation that every day these people that's watching your segment that I had to be, you know, getting all on my Instagram, my Facebook, talking about me. I didn't sign up for that. What I signed up for was to, I fell in love with somebody and I signed up to help that person and me and that person build together. And I'm being nobody else's business. I come home, I take care of me. And that was the first thing I had to do. I knew I had to rebuild my life and take care of me. And when finally, when my sons and my nephews come home, that I can rebuild with them. We can rebuild as a family. My nephew, the one that did eight years, he come home still trying to be loyal and lost his life. All this. So my life hasn't been easy for people to do the things that they do. So while they sitting there being mad, why I'm doing too much, why the fuck they doing too little? They should be doing the same thing I'm doing. I don't have, I don't have time to take care of nobody. I have to take every day, think about how I'm going to take care of Tony. Ain't nobody taking care of me. I have to figure that out. So everybody else have to figure it out and stop blaming me for the bullshit. There you have it. Uh, <laughs> Tanisa Welch, I appreciate you sharing your story. Let's see go to um, You know. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we gave you a chance to respond to whatever issues you had with previous interviews that we had, you know, that we've done. Um, you know, I feel that, you know, when you look at your story as a whole, I really feel like you took responsibility for everything that happened. And you're not painting yourself as a victim, you know, that even though what you went to prison for may not have been what you did for what they charged you with, you know, you mentioned you had done so much other stuff along the way that ultimately it was fair it was in fair. your eyes. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, I also see a, you know, like a sense of regret for the damage that you did, you know, in terms of the drugs being pushed in your neighborhood and, you know, the, the people you knew and possibly family members who got addicted in the process of you trying to make money. And, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, it really kind of humanized you in the way that you kind of laid everything out because we all, we all make bad decisions. You know, a lot of us dabbled in drug dealing at different levels and that doesn't necessarily make us bad people. You know what I'm saying? It was just something to do with the time and you don't really realize the whole scope of everything that you're doing. But, you know, ultimately you, you, you took the whole thing as an adult. You, you learn from your mistakes, you, you change your life around. And, you know, you get to see your story play out in terms of the, the domestic abuse and everything else like that in like Trap Queens and in this interview. And I think that ultimately people watching this will, will learn from some of the mistakes you made. And, you know, the girl who's dating the drug dealer who thinks that it's all going to be great and they're all going to ru- run off in the sunset at the end and they're all going to retire at some big island somewhere. No, it not, doesn't really work that it way. It doesn't work that it, way. It, it, yeah. It involves a lot of prison time. It involves murder a lot of times. Uh, you know, it involves a lot of loss. It involves overdoses. It involves, 
you know, falling out and then going broke. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know falling I mean? out. And then, you know, like I said, the only thing I wanted to come home and do is is make amends and and um do like I said, I walked up walked the the yard for three years. And you and it's like, damn, what was I really thinking? You know, you think you mature, you think you you know, somewhere I kinda lost this sense of reality. You know? And then God just you know, he put me in the middle of the desert and I had to reflect on my whole life, you know. Um, yeah. I just want to apologize for really going off at the end because really when I think about that, you know, because it's really still affecting my life. Um, yeah. And when you when you tell God and you tell your family that I'm going to change my life and this is what I'm going to do, don't come in and try to affect my life, you know? Um, there you I, have it. Yeah. There you have it. Tanisha, appreciate you coming in. Wish Thank all the you. best for you. And I, I think that your story is just beginning. I think I'm going to see a lot more for you. Uh, you think so? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. That's what it is. Cut. <laughs> Take care. Peace. Peace.